My name is Gabe Perez-Giz. Um, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I'll be uh, emceeing the rest of the show today. And we're going to begin with a keynote address by Katie Coleman, who I think you've already heard about uh, a lot during the press conference. She's flown uh, millions of orbital miles and thousands of hours on the ISS and on the space shuttle. Uh, she plays the flute in an astronaut band, all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, a lot of other, a lot of which you can ask her about during the Q and A. But without further ado, Katie Coleman. Thank you. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about life on the space station, partly because I wish I was still there. Uh, I was up there in, in 2010, 2011. Um, the last part of my mission, Ron Guerin, who's also running around here um, today, he was uh, on the same crew. So you'll see uh, his name on my patch as well, or my name on his patch, as he likes to say. And this was our home, and I just want to show you enough of what it was like up there to have you thinking, because you're problem-solving, fascinating people, to have you understand a little bit about our world so that you can help us with it, and so it can make you think about life here on Earth as well. Uh, next, Kate. Uh, the space station is actually very big. You shouldn't feel small for us. It's sorry for us that we that we're in a really tiny little place because it's huge. It's like eight train cars all put together without the seats. It's just some of them are up or down or sideways. And it's a wonderful place. The whole no gravity thing, the best part is that you fly from place to place. And I loved that. Next. I launched from uh, Baikonur in a Russian Soyuz in December of 2010. Next. We docked with the International Space Station. That is our Soyuz. It's about the size of two VW Bugs, where one, you know, the first end that actually docks the space station is, is uh, one part. It's kind of like a little orbital living room. And then the part that we have, the three seats, where we do actually sit very, very close. And for people who are taller than I am, like Richard Garriott, who also made his way to space, you have three astronauts here today. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty small, tight place to be, but we only spend, uh, actually it's less time than when Richard and I went. So when Richard and I went, we launched, it takes eight and a half minutes to get to space, and then you spend about a day and a half kind of getting everything set and making sure everybody feels great and you know just figuring everything out, and then you dock with the space station. But now they dock with the space station about six hours later. And even though that's really nice to be able to get up to the big volume, have the nice bathroom, you know, all those kinds of things, um, I really treasured that day and a half of three people who got to really actually have a little time to think about what they were about to go and do. And while they were thinking about it, you are orbiting the Earth in a very tiny little spacecraft, just you, not some big space shuttle that's like the size of an airplane, just you in your planet, in your spacecraft, and I loved that. Next. This is uh, Dimitri Kondratyev in the middle and Paolo Nespoli, my crewmates. So we go up in threes. I, Ron Guerin is not in this picture. I told you I was in space with him. It's because I went up with these three people. Three people were there. We make six. That's patch number one. And then when three people come back, that are three people come home and three more go up. That was Ron and his crew. And that's how we form sort of combinations of six. Next. It's, no, it's good, it's good. So those are our two patches from our two missions. And I think that your teams here as a hackathon uh, are very similar to being on a space crew where, you know, in some ways you pick your teams, but in some ways you don't, where there's maybe somebody standing there and then they say, you know, I really think I should be on your team and then you have them. And you know, it's kind of like the teams that we have. We don't pick them, but for our mission, which is important, then we are a team and we have to figure out how to get the best out of everyone on the team. These are some of the exercises that we do ahead of time, practicing in the simulators, you know, for the small spacecraft, for the space suit. The space suit weighs about 300 pounds, so we practice in a pool. But now it's launch night and we are doing the final preparations, some really wonderful traditions by the Russians. I'm waving to my son who uh, looks very small there but is now taller than I am and I think in the Minecraft uh, uh, room <laughs> as we speak. And we report in, I begged the guys to take small steps and um, maybe slowly but they kind of forgot we were all a little nervous. 
climb into this little bitty, actually the smallest elevator imaginable, and then the little bitty rocket. We are in the very top part of that, which is the uh, like a little triangle kind of part, not the tiny spiky long stick, but the part right underneath that. And every time I've done this, which is three, there is something just viscerally clear to you that leaving the planet is a really hard thing to do. And a lot of things have to go right. And those things are all things that scientists and engineers have designed. This is us up in space. This is my favorite scene in the movie where, I mean, it is flying from place to place. Don't you miss that, Richard? And speaking of flying, so we were in the beginning of the supply ship business. This is a Japanese supply ship. I was the second person to reach out using the controls of the ro robotic arm and capture a, a supply ship, which is the size of a school bus. I had very good space hair, as you notice. <laughs> All of us would have good, well, I don't know. Uh, Ron, uh, Ron had good space hair, too, but mine was better. This is another supply ship docking. So we had a lot of different missions coming. I'm going to show you some pictures from supply ships in just a few minutes. This is the, the sort of new NASA where we have taken the things that we know how to do, which is bringing stuff up and down to space, low Earth orbit, our space station, and bringing people up and down to space. This is a visit from the space shuttle. And there, so you're looking at the tiny thing in the middle is the space shuttle. and that is us on the space station. We are taking pictures of them. They are taking pictures of us. It's not just all for Instagram. Part of it is a formal documenting of the heat shield on the shuttle. It was probably the most nervous I was the entire mission in that you have to take hundreds of photographs in quick succession, all in focus. And, uh, and if you don't, then we have to take extra time when the space shuttle is docked to the space station to do those photographs. It's really, really difficult. Uh, to do. And, and so what did I do? I practiced. That's what we do for the hard things. We practice, practice, practice. And then you have to leave that nervousness behind because you know you've done everything you can to be prepared. So there's the space shuttle docked. Our crewmates are coming aboard. Steve Lindsay, my friend Nicole. Nicole Stott was the first person to capture a supply ship. And they brought up a big giant piece of the space station. And this shows you how wild everything behaves in space, including power cords. And this is our robot, Robonaut. Paolo and I unpacked him. He's, he's our assistant up there. We're learning what can humans and robots do. The robot is the one on the left. Now, <laughs> in that picture, Scott Kelly is on board the space station again. Richard and Ron and I, who are here with you today, are insanely jealous that he is already back there. In that it, it, it's a magical place. It's a, it's a place where I felt privileged to be one of six humans that were that were there, and, uh, and I just think there's a lot of really good work to do there, and yet look at just all the detail in that picture. Look at the kitchen table at an angle, and, and I'm doing some liquids experiments here. I mean, there's so many different things all over the space station. Most of them are not optimally designed, and that's where we could use your help to make our life simpler so that we can do the important work that can't be done on the ground. Next. So this is our crew, and uh, again, Scott on the right there uh, is uh, up in space again. He's part of a very important mission, the year-long mission, where he is going to be up there for a year to help understand the effects on the human body up in space. He has a twin brother here on the ground, and he will be sort of a ground test. We also do before space, during space, and after space tests. Many, many, many tests. Uh, I myself, every time I would do a, a data take, it typically would be 20-something tubes of blood that they're taking to test all sorts of different studies that we're doing, many of which help you right back down here on Earth. Next. Uh, spacewalks uh, is what maybe what you think of up there that we're doing, and we do them when necessary. Unfortunately, we were very chagrined that there was no uh, emergency spacewalks on our mission. In fact, one night an alarm rang in the middle of the night, and we all, you know, come out of our little cabins. It's like phone booth size places. Four of us sleep at one end of the station, two at the other end. We meet in the middle at the main computer, and Scott, it was, it was the, Scott was the commander at the time. He looks at the computer and he goes, "Yes." 
it is a box out there on S0, which translated means it's a really important, like physically, box. It's got a lot of electrical and data connections in it, and it's gone belly up. And we are, yet, and we are thinking, yes, spacewalk, us, yes. <laughs> Minutes later, the ground calls. They say, oh, you know, that's what it is, big box on S0. We've got a spare out there. We just have to uh, send the commands to reroute, reroute power and data, and we'll be all set. You could go back to bed. We're like, thanks. <laughs> but you know what? It's, it's about the mission, and you don't always get to choose what your favorite part of the mission is or even what you think is the most important. That's why we've got an army of folks down here to help decide those things. And an international space station, 16 different countries participating where we're doing experiments for all of those countries. Next. Uh, I wanted to real quick just show supply ship stuff because it's going to happen if everything goes right again starting Monday. So just a little view of that. You see the station. You see the robotic arm poking out. The little bitty thing against the background of the Earth, that is the school, school bus sized uh, supply ship. Next. S size of a school bus. Next. It's like you're driving down the highway at the same speed, and it's going to be like Indiana Jones, you know, jumping into the next train because they're both going the same speed. Um, so reaching out, using the controls of the robotic arm to capture that. Next. This is Paolo and I in the cupola doing that together. Next. Uh, Nicole Stott, who was the first. Next. And a very cool picture. You, if you are from New York, may be in this picture. Can you check out the geography there? Do you see Long Island, New York City, right in back of the school bus size thing, right above the robotic arm? So this is New England in this picture. I looked out after I did this, and suddenly there it was. I grabbed the camera, took this picture. I um, mean, look down there, you see Lake Ontario, you see the Finger Lakes in wintertime. Next. So real quick, a preview for next week. SpaceX is going to launch a Dragon supply ship. And Samantha Cristoforetti Tara and Terry Verts will be the capture team. I'm pretty sure that Samantha is the one that will be operating the arm next. And there's uh, Samantha up in space next. And this is what this is what the last uh, dragon capture looked like. So they capture the supply ship next, bring it onto the station, actually just locate it in place, line it all up. Here's a lot of cool robotics for you, robotics challenge people next. Next. Just a different view of a different chip, but it just shows you what it looks like. Next. And the unique thing about the SpaceX ships is that all that data that I talked to about understanding what happens to the body after a year or even after a few months up in space, you know, blood samples, urine samples, different things that are more timely that we want to get down to Earth, we can't analyze up there. Um, different kinds of experiments, we're doing a lot of different experiments where we want the results uh, to be analyzed down on the ground. They can come down on the SpaceX capsule. When we come down, the three of us in the Soyuz, there's not really much room for anybody but us. Next. It's a marvelous, amazing uh, env microgravity environment. Uh, I think the thing to notice about this picture is that you see about six pieces of chocolate floating. You notice the other 24 of them are somewhere. <laughs> Doesn't take long for the supplies to get opened. <laughs> next. But mostly there's experiments and next. If this might not go, sometimes this video doesn't go. Next. There's two of them. Yeah. Keep going. And keep going one more time. So this is why we go. Liquids. We need to understand what they want to do, both for going to Mars, understanding you know, how much fuel do you need for, for, to go to Mars, how do you measure it, those kinds of things, and also for us on Earth. Everything that involves flow through a pipe, we are doing our best, but we don't know everything. We know a lot about the main part of the flow. We don't understand what happens at the walls. Really small forces. You see these forces actually every day, whether it's rain on a car, whether it's spread out or curled up like a ball if it's a really clean car. Um, looking in your glass of milk or water or whatever else you have in your glass, you know, you see those liquid molecules climbing up the side of the glass just at that very little edge, just right there. And it's because those liquid molecules want to be together, but they also like the glass. And so it's that, uh, that it's those 
um, those forces, which are very, very, very small compared to gravity, that we don't get to understand because here on Earth we know what liquids are gonna do. Wherever gravity is, that is where they're gonna go, down. And so up in space we get to see what do they really want to do. Next. Combustion, same thing, where without much gravity, we can, it slows down the combustion process. Measurements that we have to take in less than a second to determine the slope of a line, we can take over 30 or 40 seconds up in space. And so we can, we're able to understand more about how combustion happens, how pollution happens, how soot is produ produced. All those kinds of questions are answered, are able to be looked at differently up there, and it gives us more possibilities for our research down here on the ground for understanding our use of fuel on the planet. Next. Crystal growth. Uh, Richard actually I think is going to, are you going to talk about crystal growth? Yep. Um, and so I'll just say that on the left is what I call the ugly earth crystal. Um, in the middle there, or on the right, is the beautiful space crystal. Because of the lack of gravity, we have the p possibility to form more perfect crystals and to build materials in a more perfect way, which can help us down on the ground to understand materials, like protein crystals for designing drugs to cure diseases, like semiconductor chips, everything you want to be a crystal that you need to understand a structure. Um, those are the kinds of things we can do in a different way up there. Gives us more possibilities down here. Next. Uh, plants, going, growing plants for Mars. We're, we don't have a lot of spare power or spare water or good dirt. Well, there's places where at least one of those things is true, where they need to grow food down here on Earth, but also for our way to Mars. Next. A lot of human experiments. Next. Uh, the one I like to just point out because it's such an important thing is osteoporosis. Up in space, we are really exciting lab rats, okay? Because we lose bone 10 times faster than a woman who is 70 years old who has osteoporosis. What she loses in bone in a year happens to me in one month if I don't do anything. But the great news is, and I can only share my own data, is that I actually came back to Earth with the same amount of bone that I left with. It's probably not the same, and I will be a lab rat for NASA for my whole life. Every year I go and visit, and I've, every time any one of us has something taken out, everybody wants to see it. Um, but we are, we are, because those things happen so fast, and because we tend to have cleaner medical histories than your average 70-year-old um, woman with osteoporosis, and not, and not taking as many you know, medications maybe to keep us uh, together, we make really, really good data points to understand this really, really important disease. Next. It's quite a family up there. I, I love it that all of, there's so many of us get to go on the space shuttle. We brought a number of different kinds of people and all of us bring different ideas and different passions to this business, to this place, which is a, as, um, as Ron says, well, this is you know the International Space Station, but down here on Earth, we are Spaceship Earth. Next. I myself am a musician, and not an amazing one, but an enthusiastic one. I brought flutes for the Chieftains, an Irish band. And next. And you know, I've just I've been having a little video problem. So you'll have to check this out on the web for yourself. If you look up Space Duet, I brought Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull's flute up there. And we did a little duet between Earth and space. And I can tell you exactly when and where it first was done. And that is because I was in space four years ago uh, to tomorrow. Well, I was in yesterday, today too. But tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight. And Ian Anderson played a concert in Russia on that anniversary. And he uh, and I did this duet for the first time at that concert in Russia honoring Yuri Gagarin, who was the first person to leave the planet, but not the last. Next. That's our window from space looking out. Next. And a little perspective on how big we are compared to the Earth. Not so big. Next. This is really how the window is, in a way. And Ri what Richard talked about today, earlier in a press conference, about a program that he instigated 
because he wanted to be able to take certain pictures of the earth and he wanted them to be organized in a way he could do it really efficiently. And when I was taken to pictures of the earth before that program, I ended up having to basically, okay, so let's see, it's going to be Long Island on the right, and this is on the left, and then I'm going to be upside down, which way is which, and this program makes it possible for all of us to take the pictures that we need of our Earth. Next. Next. See, it's true. Italy, indeed, shaped like a boot. And they are working on the Space Apps Challenge right now. Hello, Italy. <laughs> Next. And Hopefully you are in this picture. Long Island, Cape Cod, Boston, Hudson River. Next. It's a beautiful earth. Next. Well, just a little bit about landing and then we'll uh, take a couple questions and go on to the next presentation. We're trying to get back on schedule. In this capsule about the size of a small smart car, we land in a parachute. Next. Looks bad. But actually, that is science and engineering at work. There are thrusters that file, fire right before we hit the ground because we're like falling, 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 even in a parachute, pretty fast. And then psst, supposedly they call them soft landing jets. None of us will agree that that's a good name for them. But it's uh, softer than it would have been, landing jets. Uh, people ask me how the landing was. I say, solid. <laughs> Next. Science and engineering were at work again. You can see that part of the spacecraft has burned up. It was supposed to. A certain amount of it, we know how much to put on there. And, and if you look at the, the helicopters are there, they knew where to go. Science and math at their best. We've worked all, out a lot of the details and it happens pretty nicely these days. And at the same time, it's very complicated as are most of the things that all of us in this room do and certainly the things we do at NASA. And that's why we need you here at Space Apps Challenge to make our life easier and to take the good work that we do and take it further. Next. Next. Thank you for satellite phones, for letting me speak to my family. Actually, every day on the space station using an internet protocol phone, and then just a few minutes after landing in Kazakhstan. Next. OK. This is the, one of the last pictures. And I show you this picture of myself, my crew. That includes um, Scott Kelly, my commander, who's now up in space again, his twin brother, Mark, and Mark's crew, who was on the space shuttle, President Obama. When I was the age of all the people doing the hackathon here, of the younger ones, no one knew I was going to be in a picture this, like this. And we don't know who are going to be the ones to wear the suits of the future, who are going to be the ones to pave the paths of the future. I guarantee you some of them, and many of them probably, are here today. So realize that we don't know what pictures will be composed like this in the future, but we have to have the tools that we need to be ready to be part of those teams. Next. We've got a lot of really cool things to do at NASA. We can't wait to do them, but the younger people, some of them who are, who are here, and some of whom I hope you'll reach out to, all of you hackers, when you go home, I hope, hope you will share this hackathon everywhere because especially the younger people we need. I would say the kids, you know, younger, but even, you know, 13, 11, 12, all those, those ages. Next. So we've got places to go in our space program, and we appreciate all your help here at the Space Apps Challenge in helping us to get there and get there in a way that humans want to go. Thank you. So I'll take a few questions, but then I am here all weekend long, and I'll be walking around, and uh, I'll sign whatever needs signed. I'll take any picture with anybody. I am yours until uh, tomorrow when we give the prizes out. And uh, I'm happy to take a few questions. We may not have time for too many. We'll do a couple, uh, but just a brief announcement first. Uh, for people watching online, if you want to tweet some questions, we may take some questions from Twitter during the show. Just uh, put hashtag AskSpaceApps, and we'll be getting some stuff from the Twitter feed. And, and I'll be watching Twitter, too, and I'll answer from Twitter. Any questions for Katie? Bruce Lincoln of Silicon Home. I want to ask a question if you know about this. I know that Vint Cerf is working on an interplanetary internet. 
the idea of an internet that can help um, facilitate communications both as you go back to the moon and as you go back to Mars. Can you talk about that at all, Katie? You know, I actually can't. I'm wondering if Richard, when he comes up, will be able to address interplanetary internet. Yeah, see? It takes a whole, and, and I'm informed we are working on it. <laughs> well, but you know, it's actually just not something that I know about. Um, I appreciate that Bruce is here from Silicon Harlem. Uh, he was at our, at our data boot camp yesterday, which was, if you were not here, if you didn't get to go or go see it, go check it out online. And uh, summaries of it will be, I think, available. Uh, we, we filmed the whole thing. Hi. Um, Bruce, uh, the Internet Society, we have uh, an interplanetary chapter with Vint that are working on this delay tolerant networking and all this kind of stuff. Join the chapter, you can find all about it. Uh, they're going to have a, I, I'm going to look it up and present later because they're going to have, I think, in Washington, D.C. in June or sometime, they're going to have a whole conference on it. Thank you very much. See, you never know who's here and who's going to have what you need. But again, uh, for the data bootcamp, it was just a really inspirational thing where we tried to make sure that the hackers of tomorrow realize that they should actually be here today. But and, and many of them came, and even more I think we'll have next year because suddenly they realized, and this was mostly girls under the age of 18, realized that this was for them as well, and they had a place here. So I think that we probably need to uh, go ahead to Richard. Do you want to do one more? Well, I, um, unless you want to ask, I have, a, I have a question that I'm supposed to be asking for some fourth graders in Connecticut, which you made a uniquely uh, positioned answer, which is uh, when you play the flute in space, um, how does, it, how does it sound and the tonality of it compared in microgravity compared to when you play it on Earth? Any differences? Just like on Earth, it really depends where you play. Our places in our space station are different. If you play in the airlock, there's a lot of metal everywhere, or in the cupola, there's a lot of glass and so nice reflective sur uh, surfaces where it kind of echoes a little bit. And if you play in a place where it's all fabric, then it's kind of a little more of a muted, dead sound. What is distinctly different is I, I never really thought about the fact that the flute sits in your hands. And even if you watch videos of me playing on orbit, you'll actually see me kind of have to, like, before I play, sort of register it, put it in the right place, because it's just not, you're used to gravity doing that work for you. Cool. Any other questions? Or should we, do we have time for one more? Or no, we have to move on? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, guys. Thanks, Katie.